Welcome to Triple Threat, the podcast with Jamel President, where it's good news and good vibes all the time, baby. When we left Portugal to come play with you and your system, Jamel, it was the best thing for Shane because you 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 pushed him to do other things outside his box. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Jamel President and on Twitter at President Jamel. Make sure to subscribe to this podcast as I'll be bringing you a new interview every month. Hey, what's up, guys? Coming up next, we got Monty Lee, uh, who's the head coach of the Clemson Tigers baseball team. Uh, Monty and I uh, had a brief stint in college where we took a couple of classes together, and that's where we uh, kind of knew each other from that standpoint. Um, but in our interview, we talked about um, just, just the transition of the sport, how training, support is so important to athletes, and how we as a community and as a family, we reach out to try to um, um, instill those things in players. But there's a key ingredient that's missing um, when we focus on those things. And I'll let Monty talk about that in the interview. All right, let's get into it. How you doing, big guys? Long time. I'm good, man. How are you? I'm good, man. I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Hey, um, I was just thinking the other day, uh, just memorizing, what was that science? That was science? That's, that was, uh, what's extra, what, what kind of class was that? It was in the in the science building, I think, right on off of uh, 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 Wentworth, I think. Uh-huh. Um, but I know we was in class together. I can't remember which. which yeah. Thing, but you know, just I can't. I can't remember either, man. I I remember. Um, it's been. Uh, you know, I remember the the cool part. The cool part of the College of Charleston experience back in those days was we all we all used that tiny little weight room together in the corner of the yeah. gym. You know. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, exactly. Uh, Good times, man. What do you what? So what's where's life? Where's life got you right now? What do you what are you doing with with yourself right now? Yeah, just working with the Day Foundation. You know, um, that's that's primarily what I do. Just focusing on getting athletes, student athletes prepared, um, getting the right information to the next level where, you know, what matter what sport it is. So I right. contract I contract a lot with uh with uh, rec departments, with schools. And uh, right now I'm doing a lot with Portugal um, mm-hmm. with their uh, middle school and just this development of, of, of what's needed. Families don't know what they need from elementary, middle to high school. You know what I mean? Right. That information is not out there unless it's, you know, um, in other states, you got other pioneers that come and share that information. But in, in South Carolina, and depending on the sport, it's very rare that you get that information shared. So we try to be that that soundboard for parents and, and athletes. Gotcha. Yeah. <clears throat> so um, I'm not going to take up too much of your time, but um, I'll get right into it, man. Um, thanks for coming along. And what we do in this podcast, Money, is just, like I said, um, give information. We have, we, we, we interview, you know, college coaches, former student athletes, business owner, nutritionists, scouts, the whole nine. Um, and mm-hmm. then take, we try to take uh, the, the, the guests up through the, the same regimen as far as elementary, middle school and college and see those, those uh, programs that they were in and how they're, uh, we're influencing their success. So um, start off by, you know, just start telling us, you know, your parks and rivals, where you're from, how it all started, like who were your biggest support system and, um, and, 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 and int- introduce you to the sport. Yeah, sure. So, uh, you know, my name's Monty Lee. I'm, I'm the head baseball coach at Clemson uh, University. 45 years old. Um, I'm, I'm grew up in the state of South Carolina. I've lived here my whole life. Um, it's very rare, uh, for, for a coach, uh, to spend his whole career, uh, from, from his playing days to his, to his coaching days in the same state, but I've been blessed to be able to do that. I grew up, I grew up in a, a small town of Lugov, South Carolina. 
Um, very blessed uh, to live in a great community where my sport in particular, I was a baseball player and I played played uh, three sports growing up, uh, played, played football. Actually, as a kid, um, it's interesting. I was, I, I had a, a pretty well-rounded athletic experience. I, I was, uh, when I was five years old, I was involved in a, in a pretty, pretty bad car wreck. We had a family car wreck that mm-hmm. caused a severe uh, skull fracture and concussion. Oh, so wow. that, kept out, that, kept, that kept me out of being able to play football uh, when I was a little kid. So my first sports were baseball, uh, basketball, and soccer. And wow. I played I played soccer until I was in middle school, along with basketball and baseball. Uh, started playing football in middle school. I played football, basketball, and baseball until I got to high school. Gotcha. Uh, once I got to high school, I actually wrestled for a couple years. Uh, continued to play football, wrestled, and played baseball. Uh, and then I had another injury, um, <laughs> I had a, a major shoulder surgery from playing football. Uh, thank God it was on my non, my non throwing arm. For sure, uh, kept me from playing football, um, and then it also kept me from wrestling. I could no longer wrestle because of just uh, severe, uh, repetitious dislocations of my shoulder over and over. For sure. uh, so I had to be prepared, and that was really, and I I say that, and to say that it was probably the first time that I actually just focused on baseball. Gotcha was my junior year of high school. Wow, wow, wow. So yeah, much later, and I think that was more re- more prevalent during that time period where kids typically didn't focus on one sport till later. And I think when I got to college, I was fortunate enough to play baseball and was an everyday starter at the College of Charleston for four years. I feel like my development as a baseball player um, was – was really good over my college years because I didn't focus on just baseball growing up. Right. Right. And I, at just the variety, the, the mental and physical development that sports like football and wrestling and basketball, just taking pieces of those different sports, uh, made me a, a pretty well-rounded athlete. Um, and also dealing with injuries at a younger age, um, it, it helped me tremendously when I just focused on baseball. Uh, let, me, so, let me ask this question, Monty. D- yeah. You uh, sounded like, looked like you always had a, you know, a nice build, nice body. You always kept, kept solid, kept yourself solid. Were you an, you were a natural athlete, natural born athlete. That's not, that's non-negotiable. So do mm-hmm. you think, like you just said, had you had more uh, interest and more skill development in certain sports, would you be a better athlete? And were those things offered? You know, because as we get older, we realize as coaches, like, you know, oh, I didn't have this. This was missing. I could have did. So what were those things when you see in your development of, because what I'm saying, going from different sports was just a, and just your interest, right? But you had no really no, you know, uh, focus of being a collegiate athlete when you're playing at, at a young level. Do you, if, right. do you think if you had those, that support, how, how would it be, you know, different for you? Not different for you, but per se, how would you think it'd be a better well-rounded athlete? Like you said, you didn't have those things when you got in college. Well, I think that, you know, when, when you look at the development of the amateur athlete, I think when you look at it in today, in this day and age versus maybe 20 plus years ago, when, when we were coming through and, you know, everybody's walk, um, sure. walk in life as an athlete is a little bit different. For sure. But one of the, and I can only pull from my own experiences as an athlete when I played. And then also I, I now have 22 years experience coaching sure. uh, and 20 of that's been at the power five level. So I've had a chance to see athletes in this day and age versus athletes when I was coming up. And, and yes, there's, we, it, we are far superior in our ability to give athletes information and develop athletes now whether it's strength and conditioning, uh, movement patterns, skill development, all of those things, we're, we're much, much more uh, educating uh, now in, in what we're doing than we were maybe back then. But I do think that I develop my skills naturally. Right. I, think that, 
I think that when when we were we played strictly for the enjoyment of playing the sport. For sure, for sure. So I think that there's been the major divide that I see, uh, and this may take me a little bit of time to to describe on sure. the podcast. But when 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 I was growing up, one of the things that I that I found very profound was I always played for my community. Mm. So there was no travel baseball. There was no travel AAU. There was none of that. You played for your community. Mm. Uh, And when you played for your community, there was a sense of pride uh, for playing for your community. And you felt a responsibility because socially as a, as a kid, everybody was going to play either football or soccer in the fall. For sure. Everybody was going to play basketball in the winter everybody was going to play baseball in the spring. Um, And then in the summertime, um, you know, a lot of times it was going to the pool, spending time with your friends. There was no, uh, no iPhones. There was no internet. There was no computers. So your social environment had to be connection with other people. Exactly. So I feel like the relationship side of things Mm -hmm. were, were much stronger Mm -hmm. because of the bonds that we, you know, because of connection, our bonds uh, and our relationships and our competitive nature towards mm. each other for the team uh, was, was, was greater That's a good uh, point. because we were very, very connected with each other because we played all the sports together. It wasn't yeah. just played baseball together. We played football. We, we wrestled, we played basketball. We played all those sports in our community together. That's a good point. In today's Time Out message, we got Cedric Weber. For some reason, it always comes comes to that. To like how Coach Chris was able to just dangle, dangle something in front of every single person to get the best out of them. He'll either do it in front of you, behind your back, it don't matter. But he will dangle something to get the best out of you. But at the same token, he mentally prepared you for it. And, you know, it was up to you right. to, uh, like you always said. Always fair, too. He always was fair. Right. That's right. It was up to you to figure it out because he was going to give you that opportunity. Now, let's get back to the interview. And... So, and we didn't have a lot of coaching, so to speak, until we really kind of got into high school. I think that skill development was kind of, and winning was important, uh, but skill development naturally through just playing the sports, um, you know, it kind of, you just developed. Um, And, you know, once I got into high school and I started to really get coaching, like what it takes to win, Mm -hmm. you know, when I finally got to college, where it was really kind of the first time that I had only played baseball. Um, you know, I felt like that's when I really got better because it was the first time I had really been introduced to a structured strength training program wow. along just playing baseball. Wow. And I think now when you look at the way we are now, nobody plays for their community, really. I mean, outside right. of, you know, if you play high school football, high school basketball, high school baseball, in my sport in particular, you know, we hear all the time of kids that look forward to getting done with their high school baseball season to play travel baseball. Exactly. Exactly. And I, and I'm assuming it may be the same way, you know, in other sports that getting recruited, um, putting out my own individual profile and trying to push myself to get recruited. It's more about getting recruited and getting somewhere else besides playing for your community. Um, we're seeing more and more at a very young age, kids getting private hitting lessons and strength and conditioning coaches, their own individual conditioning coaches. And one of the things that we see now is once a kid gets to college, they're more physically developed and have been coached and developed individually than ever before. But the team concept is what Mm -hmm. we have. Mm -hmm. Um, Mm -hmm. and we also feel like from a development standpoint that kids, they don't continue to progress from their freshman year on as much as they used to because they played so much more baseball Mm. and they played weight since they were 14 years old. Um, 
you know, we, we call it an early mature. They're, the athletes today are simply, they mature earlier than they used to. Uh, so we look for guys that are more well-rounded. If, if we find a kid that has played multiple sports, mm-hmm. if we find a kid that, uh, that hasn't been in the weight room a lot, right, um, right. we tend to find that those kids, the more well-rounded athlete that hasn't been physically developed yet, those are the guys that make major jumps in college. Because they got a they got a gap to be filled. They haven't yeah. have that gap filled yet. So they yeah. just, they haven't reached their ceiling yet. But coach, let me ask you a question. And we talk about the, the collegiate athlete um, coming from high school and you know getting going to the college of Charleston. What were your your recruitment wars? How did that happen? How did you end up at the college of Charleston? Um, and because we, we asked our guests or so the audience to know about that, that whole regimen, because we talked about, yeah, athletes are coming more prepared skill development wise, but don't have that sense of relationship and team concept. Um, right. So it's a, it's a give and take, because I don't know what co- coaches would rather have a kid that's got good great team concept of a kid that's highly skilled, but the, the great ones having them both. Right. What were your yeah. recruitment wars and how you end up to the cause of Charleston? Yeah, that was a that was an interesting dynamic, and I think that because I, because I played a lot of um, a lot of sports coming up, and really not until my junior year did I strictly focus on baseball. Uh, I was a little bit more of a late developer. Gotcha. Um, I was I was a, I was a good baseball player, but I think once I focused primarily on baseball, and um, you know, my junior year of high school was really the first time that I kind of looked around and said, you know, I may be the best arguably the best player on the field mm-hmm. you know I'm I, I I can play this game it was kind of the first realization that I think I can play this game at the next level mm-hmm. I think I can play college baseball and because recruiting back then was different recruiting was much later gotcha college coaches weren't showing up to recruit you in the spring of your junior year it was really the summer going into your senior fall that you begin to get recruited Mm-hmm. So I didn't really even hear from college coaches until the spring of my senior year. Wow. I mean, I had no idea, you know, where I was going to go play college baseball. I was just hoping for an opportunity. Just give me a uniform. Right. And I right. play. I was. Um, so when the College of Charleston called me right at the beginning of the playoffs of my senior years, when it all kind of heat up for, um, you know, for me, started to get, um, you know, calls from several mid-major division one programs and in division two programs not a lot of interest it wasn't a ton of calls but the college of charleston was really the first school they called and they offered me a scholarship on the very first call got you so you um, so, so you decided to take that call i mean to take that take that uh that interest what i did what, go ahead you can say something yeah no and I, I immediately, when they called and offered me a scholarship, I went down to visit that weekend, fell in love with the city. I had only been to Charleston on vacation, like as a little kid. I didn't know much about the city, and it's so different. Charleston's, uh, you know, it's kind of like its own state. It's, it's <laughs> way different than the rest of South Carolina. I agree. Uh, so it was just so unique to me, all the architecture uh, and all the history. The baseball program was fairly new at that time. Um, I just thought it was a unique campus. I love the fact that you could walk around the whole campus. Sure. And you didn't have to drive all over the place. It wasn't spread out. It was all together. Um, it was a very diverse, uh, diverse campus compared to, um, you know, growing up in small town, South Carolina. Right. So I felt like a place that culturally I could grow and open my eyes to, um, you know, different people from different parts of the country. Um, it was just unique. It was different. Um, and I liked it. Um, and they showed me the most interest and, you know, I've, and I've used that experience from my recruiting and recruiting kids mm-hmm. and, you know, in my 20 plus years of coaches, like, well, who wants you the most? I mean, sure, for sure. it's not necessarily the school or the program. It's the coach that's recruiting you. Is he recruiting you harder than everybody else? Because right. that guy really wants you to come play for him, um, or her. Right. And, uh, you know, they're, they're probably going to give you the best opportunity. Right. Uh, and so um, that was my experience. And what were some challenges coming from high school to the collegiate level? Were you talking about the athletics and the type of athletes that in high school you get probably got about 
you know, 20% good, you know, that's good athletes on the team, but in college, it's probably about 80%. What were some yeah. of the challenges from that transition from high school to college? The greatest challenge for me, number one, was not only coming to school and uh, having to develop those relationships with your teammates, mm. it was to fit in, like, where do I fit? Mm. I think that in that first year, there's a lot of insecurity where I know I'm a good player. Am I as good as some of these guys? Can I play with these guys? It takes you a little bit of time to get comfortable. And, and, and you know, I think as a freshman, a lot of times you try to do too much. For sure. Uh, you know, you, 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 you try to practice harder to stand out. And you, you, you probably play. I think I probably played scared a little bit. Right. And insecure as a freshman were like, and I'm not saying not scared in like um, – you know, I was, I, I, I didn't want to practice or I didn't want to play, but it was more of, well, what if I fail? Making you know, a mistake. What, yeah. yeah. Like what if I make a mistake or, you know, and I'm, I'm, you know, do I belong? I think right. that's the first question is, do I belong at this level? And, uh, you know, there was just a lot of insecurity as a true freshman. And then once I got more comfortable and started to realize I can, play with these guys like I'm good enough I belong on the field I should be starting mm -hmm. like I'm better than some of these guys I can play you know once I got in there and kind of dealt with that failure and the insecurities of being a freshman and started to really see that I can do it um, then the rest was history I played every day for four years um, but I think that the one key for me and the one thing that I tell our freshmen now from my experience is you belong Mm. And from day one, I don't care that you're a freshman, uh, but you belong and you have to believe every day that I belong on this field and I could compete with anybody. And it doesn't mean that you're necessarily going to start. You may have an older player who's more experienced or you may have someone who's simply more talented than you are, but your job should be to push them. For sure. For sure. And to push them push the other guys that are in your position to make them better. Right. Um, and I think when you do that, when you become, when you think of it more along those lines of I'm going to push others around me to be their best, oftentimes you play your best. The most important message to get across to student athletes suffering from mental health issues is that you're not alone. Many student athletes deal with depression, anxiety, eating disorders, and other mental health struggles. If this is the case, speak to someone like a counselor, a parent, a trusted adult, or your fellow teammate. Adults who are supporting a student athlete should be aware of the signs. A student athlete who is experiencing mental health difficulties might have constant fatigue, loss of appetite, mood swings, apathy, or even declining grades and or social isolation. A student athlete's mental health can be severely affected by an injury. An athlete's entire life becomes about their sport. And when they lose the ability to play, it can take a huge toll mentally. As we continue to reduce the stigma around mental health, hopefully more middle and high school level student athletes will feel confident discussing their health, whether it be mental or physical. The Triple Threat Podcast will be adding a psychology aspect in season two. We will be doing our part to help destigmatize mental health when it comes to student athletes. So subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform so you never miss an episode. Now let's get back to the interview. And you, and you made a good point there, Coach, and when you're talking about recruiting those kids that haven't reached their ceiling yet, but at the yeah. same time, yes, you, they come in with high energy and high interest, but you're saying as coaches, you also have to give them confidence every day and let them know that they belong. And that's, and that's huge in, in the, into their, their, their personal development. Cause like you said, as a freshman, you're trying to figure this thing out. And if you've right. got nobody telling you, Hey, look, 
you 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 you're going to be okay. You got potential. Then that can that can really lead uh, a good athlete astray because they didn't really wasn't mentally focused and prepared um, to handle that that transition from high school to college. Well, I think it's also it's one of, it's kind of the first time those the kids have been working so hard to get recruited and find a place to go play. Mm-hmm. Now you got to start over, you know, now you're, you've landed, you've landed in the place that you wanted to go. Now you got to make something of it. And, you know, we, we tell our freshmen, look, if you're not making mistakes, you're not learning. So you're, you're going to, I don't want you to be apprehensive. I don't want you to be afraid of failure. I don't want you to be insecure. You know, I want you to fail and fail mightily. You know, I want you to, that's the only way that we're going to be able to coach you and develop, develop you is by aggressive mistakes. So be aggressive, compete. Uh, you know, that's our number one goal in the freshman. Hey, show me that you can compete. Just go out there and compete and play as hard as you can. Fail. Fail's gonna, failure's going to happen. Don't worry about your numbers. Don't worry about your ERA, your batting average, all that stuff. Who cares? I just want to see that you're a competitor and that when you do fail, it gives us an opportunity to coach you and for you to make adjustments and grow as a player. Now, that's where the separator comes. Exactly. Exactly. It, You know, once you start to make those mistakes and we start to see what are your chinks in your armor, Mm. you know, what areas do you really need to work on and get better at? Can you do that? Can you make those adjustments? Can you work on your weaknesses? Because I think especially in the game of baseball where, you know, we're failing 70 percent of the time we hit 300 or you're a good hitter if you fail 70 percent of the time. So Mm. for me. You know, the practice environment's very important. If you're failing in certain areas of the game, you have to practice those areas. You can't just go and do the feel-good stuff. It's interesting. You know, right. you, know you, you can't just go in there and shoot free throws and layups right. and basket, right? right. You sure. parts of the game in baseball, you got to work on the parts of the game that you're not very efficient at, and you can't always do the feel-good drills and 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 the the things that – just build your confidence. Like you've got to look in the mirror and say, I'm struggling in these areas of the game and I've got to attack these areas because if I do that, that's going to build confidence for me. When I get a little bit better in the weakest areas of my game, um, you know, that's when the player really starts to become a better version of themselves. I agree. <clears throat> so you coach, you're talking about as a freshman in the college starting over, right? So once mm-hmm. you go through, your sophomore, junior, senior season, it's almost time to start over again. Yeah. Take us back to Spartanburg Methodist. When you started yeah. over, you started as a freshman starting to coach. How mm. were, what were some challenges at that point? And what would you tell some potential coaches about their relationship and what their, what their need is when it comes to call it to, to head coaches per se? Cause we don't need, right. we don't need, we don't want assistant coaches getting, you know, too much in a way. We don't want them being too much out of the way. What's a happy meeting right. that you would say to a coach that's listening to this this podcast? Well, I think the one thing that I was blessed with is I, my the first two coaches that I – well, the only two coaches that I worked for as an assistant, which were my first eight years in coaching, was two years at Spartanburg Methodist with Tim Wallace, who is in the Hall of Fame uh, and is still there to this day. And then um, – you know, my third year coaching from year three to year eight, I worked for Ray Tanner, who's a Hall of Famer and a national champion. So I got a chance to work for two Hall of Fame coaches and they were very similar. Um, and they were similar in that they did not micromanage me. Mm. Uh, they basically said, OK, you're going to be our hitting coach, our base running coach and our outfield coach. Mm-hmm. OK, so that's what you do. You coach the players to the best of your ability in those areas, and and that's it. And that's what I did. So I worked. So my job, and I felt like one of the things that set me up for success later on, and I didn't realize it. It wasn't like I planned it out this way, but I just tried to dominate my role. Mm. You know, that was really it. I didn't. I didn't worry about any of the other areas of the game that did not pertain to me. Mm -hmm. Ed coach wanted me to be the hitting coach. So I made sure that I dominated that, Mm -hmm. that I did all my early work with the hitters. I had individual plans and drill packages for every hitter. I helped them through the process of their at bats, all of that. I was the sounding board for the offense, uh, but I wanted to make sure that 
we created an edge in the areas that I coached. Um, base running, I, I, I made sure that anytime we would incorporate base running in the practice plan that I was running that part of practice. I didn't worry about anything else on the field but that. Uh, and then outfield play, I made sure every day that I worked with the fundamental aspects of outfield play with my guys. So I just dominated my role. I didn't worry about the other parts of the game because that the, co the head coach didn't want me to do those things. And if he asked me something about something else that was not within my role, that was fine. I would answer. Mm. Um, but I think young, uh, the one thing that I would say with being an assistant coach is you have your job is to make the life of the head coach easier. Whatever he tells you he wants you to do, you do that and stay out of the way of the other areas. Another challenge for assistant coaches, I think sometimes, and our ego gets in the way, is if the head coach has a different philosophy <laughs> you do um, when it comes to certain areas of the game, you have to coach, you have to coach it the way the head guy wants it. You know, so like if you're, if the head coach, you know, wants your, you know, the offense to be a, a speed and situational hitting offensive club and you're more of a power oriented guy, well, then you got to coach to, to what the head guy wants. Like you have to understand that I have to adjust my philosophy. Um, and then I think it's important though, if you disagree with um, ph philosophical things with the head coach, sit down with the head coach one-on-one -on -one and say, coach, this is why I believe what I believe. And I just want to get a sense of, you know, are, are there some things that maybe I believe as an assistant coach that we can implement with our guys mm. or girls mm. that will make it better? I think it's always about making sure that if you feel a certain way as an assistant coach, because I, ha I know the feeling of getting bogged down with being an assistant where you get frustrated because maybe, you know, the head coach does it a certain way and you don't feel like it may be the best way to do it. And I know when I'm the head coach, I'm going to do it differently. Every assistant always says that, right? Mm -hmm. But you be able to go to the head coach and respectfully have those types of conversations with them. And what I have found is when I became a head coach, it's amazing how even though philosophically maybe I believe things a little bit differently than the head coaches I work for, I tended to realize when I became a head coach, I did a lot of things the way those guys did it. Mm -hmm. So there was a, there was a lot of wisdom that they had that as a young egotistical assistant coach that when you get, when you finally sit at that next chair as a head coach, those guys did what they did for a reason. And they were a whole lot smarter than you realized. Right. So that's, that's kind of that's, been experience. That's a good point. And, and, and to sum it up, you know, when you're talking about talking about the assistant coaches is, you know, never outshine the master, right? That's just rule number one. But when you became a head coach and you was interviewing for the job for Clemson, when you applied for the job for Clemson, take us back to, to, to that feeling when you got hired and, and, and what did you think as a head coach using all the experiences from assistant coaches? How do you deal with, again, your, your, your assistant coaches and your expectations, you know, being a head coach now? Yeah, I think that, you know, just because of my experiences as an assistant, I t I've, I've tended to do it the same way uh, where I give – once I delegate those responsibilities to those coaches, I try to stay out of their way. And then I meet, we meet every day as a staff at nine 30, we go over either the practice plan or the lineup. And then our pitching coach will go over who we're thinking about pitching in today's game and why. And we kind of meet as a staff to give everybody that opportunity to speak up. Mm. And sometimes um, it's very productive. Sometimes as a head coach running the meetings, I have to get a sense of how productive this meeting is going. If I feel like it's not going that well, I'll just end it. You mm -hmm. know, I just immediately, I think as a leader of the staff, you have to take a pulse of the room and see, okay, are we, are we really being productive here? Or do I just need to leave and let them go to their individual offices and work on what they need to work on? Mm -hmm. So I think it's important for assistant coaches to have that voice, um, which is probably the biggest difference with what I do as a head coach versus, uh, you know, what it was like when I was an assistant. We didn't have a lot of staff meetings. It was more kind of one-on-one -on -one meetings. Um, and I think there's value in both. But, you know, going 
you know, going from an assistant to a head coach and then coming to, you know, a school like Clemson, I think it's just there's so many people as you climb up that ladder, there's so many more people that work for you. You know, when you talk about resources, like the resources mm. as the as the job grows into a bigger school with more resources, it almost ma it makes it almost more challenging because I have so many more people that I have to communicate with. In today's time out message, we got BJ Mackey. What you got to understand and young guys got to understand at the high school level and, and at the middle school level, that's your fun. That's fun. That's your fun. Right. When you start going to college, that politics and the business aspect that, that, that comes into play. Right. And then when you go to the professional level and you're talking about overseas or NBA, because you're still talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Right, right. <clears throat> there ain't no friends. It's all no, business. it's all business. It's all business. Now let's get back to the interview. Um, at the College of Charleston, it was me, three assistant coaches, one academic advisor, one strength coach, and that's it, you know, and I met with the AD and there wasn't, you know, there was one compliance uh, person. There wasn't a lot of people to communicate with. So mm -hmm. it almost made life easier. Right. Right. Uh, here I've got, you know, an, a director of operations, a director of player development, uh, an assistant to the head coach two full-time assistant coaches, a volunteer assistant coach, an academic advisor, nutritionist, strength coach, sports supervisor, AD. Um, you know, it's a lot of people. And, so, uh, and, and you know, that's it's why sometimes. But that's why sports at an early age is so important. You talked about you playing these different multiple sports, having these different multiple relationships with different people. Now you being a head coach, those things, those transferable skills to just apply themselves. And that's why yep. we talk about – go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I think you're spot on. I think that communication – I think it all boils down, at the end of the day, the best coaches and, and the best guys that you ever played with, they were the ones that were interested in you mm. the most. You know, the guy that – my the best teammates are always the one that push others and invest in others and communicate the best. Um, and are relationship driven. Okay. And, you know, I mean, it's really that simple. It's no different from coaching to playing. I always felt like I was a good teammate. I always wanted to be a really good teammate and support my teammates and push my teammates and lead by example. Um, and I think that it, it's no different when you get into the workforce. It's like, you know, when you walk into the room, you either light up the room or, you know, or, or, or you don't. Right. And you want to kind of person that when when people look forward to spending time with you because they value your opinion they communicate uh with you uh they're honest with you they tell you what you need to hear not what you want to hear for sure uh, you know and and you the the players and the coaches have to know that you have their back you know that 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 you support them and um but it takes trial and error and i i think that you know but you have to be willing to invest in others um, if you want to make the most of what you do as an athlete or as a coach. I agree. And, and, and basically our, our main focus is student athletes. I mean, that was run this whole engine with everything we do. We were former student athletes as well. Mm -hmm. When you're looking at student athletes, what do you look at in far as in recruitment when it, besides the athletic side of it, what, what, what's, what's a great interest, what drags you to a kid that's take away the athletic component of it. Yeah. So we look at, we, 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 our culture as a program, we look at, we look at number one, you know, we have our expectations in our sport. We have our expectations in academics. We have our expectations in the community as a citizen, and we have our expectations in the weight room. So those are the four core areas. So when we start to recruit a student athlete, those are the four core areas that we look at. You know, obviously they have to be talented enough to play at this level on right. the on the ball side. Right. So we evaluate the skill set. 
of, of the player. You know, then when we look at academics, we want to know what kind of student are they? You know, are they a high level student? Do they take their, their academics seriously? Or are they a borderline student? Um, and you look, look, there's times where we recruit a borderline student who may, mm. who may struggle academically in certain areas, but works really hard at it. Um, so uh, for me, it's more about you know, what's the work ethic like academically for the student athlete. If, if, a, if an athlete has a strong work ethic academically, but may not be a 4.0 student or even, you know, barely as a 3.0 student, but they work very, very hard, that athlete's going to be able to make it here. Sure, for sure. So, so we have to do our homework on, you know, what type of student are they? What kind of work ethic do they have in the classroom? We try our best to do our homework on their makeup. And that's what, that's, that has a lot to do with what kind of person they are. Are they a good person? Are they a good teammate? Uh, do they get involved in their community when it comes to uh, charity? Uh, do they give back to their community? Um, you know, what type of household do they have? Um, you know, do they have any sort of red flags on their social media? Mm -hmm. um, you know, what kind of person are we dealing? Are we dealing with, with a young man of integrity? Um, you know, are we dealing with a young man of toughness, of great competitive fire? Uh, you know, those types of things, very, very important to us. Is this a selfless human being? How important is the team to this human being? Uh, you know, we, we like to know what those attributes are like as a person. Uh, and then in the weight room, like how hard does this kid work in the weight room? You know, because typically you can look at what a kid does academically and what a kid does in the weight room. And it's probably going to tell you, what you know, what, what kind of player you know, there, there's a direct correlation to kids that love the weight room and they love academic success and they love giving back to their community and being the right type of person. They, the baseball typically takes care of itself if they have skills. You said some buzzwords out there, coach. You said tough, the makeup, you know, mm -hmm. those, those buzzwords where we had coming up, like right? anything you got to deal with in sports, you stick your head down, you just deal with it. Right. Um, and that kind of segue me into my other, my other topic about, mental health, right? You know, um, right now as coaches, we have to deal with these, these situations that, like you said, the environment may cause it or what have you. Right. Um, how do you, do you think social media is, is, is have a role in dealing with how athletes, uh, we say being tough or not in how, how, how do you, how do you see it in, in, in your program? How do you athletes are dealing with it? Is it prevalent right now more than before because we're talking about it or um, I'm just interested to see your take on it at that level. And it, it, you know, do you see it on a, on a daily basis? Yeah, it's a really good question. And it's, it's one that I think that, w that we as coaches are continuing to learn more and more about. Um, and I think there, there's several things, you know, number one, you know, I kind of go back to, you know, what they call the greatest generation, right? When you look at, you know, uh, in the 1940s, all, all, all of the veterans that fought in World War II, like my grandfather, I can remember, like as a kid, my dad used to always tell me, your grandfather fought in World War II, and he will never talk about it. Mm. Mm. And I'd never heard anybody that grew up in that generation that fought in the world war that would talk about it. Mm. And I think that it was so tough on, on, it was so tough on that generation mentally, what they saw and what they dealt with, and they didn't have any resources to, mm. to talk about it. They had to deal with it. And it, and it, and it, I think developed a level of toughness, uh, in that generation because they had to deal with it. Mm. Um, and I think that moving forward, you know, even when you look at when we were coming up dealing with all the failures and adversity of being an athlete, we didn't have the resources to, to deal with it and talk right. about. It. Um, so we had to deal with it. Right. And today, the great thing that kids have today is they have counselors available to them. And there has been so much more discussion about mental health 
that kids have those resources with coaches and counselors and people that they can talk to about their problems, which is wonderful. But I think the number one cause, quite honestly, of the mental health issues that we're seeing today in kids, it's social media. Definitely social media. They've grown up on their iPhones. Look, we're all addicted to our iPhones. For sure. For sure. As much as and I are having this conversation right now, we're always on our iPhone. For sure. And we're always looking at social media because it you just you, you know, you just get immersed in so much information. But yet, instead of going out and searching for that information through books and communication with others and experiences, kids today have it right there on their phone. If they want to know about something, they can just look at it right there on their phone and they don't have to actually experience it, so to speak, and Mm. deal with it. Mm. So I don't think kids are necessarily weaker in this day and age. I think that it's just bottom line is, is they they haven't had to experience these things and deal with them on their own as much as maybe we did. Uh, so I think a lot of the mental health issues are, are, are social media. Uh, hold on one second. Um, are had a call come in. Um, but I think a lot of it, the mental health issues are, are simply because of they spend so much time on social media and they think that they have to be like, the people that they follow on social media and their um, how many likes you get, how many retweets you get determines how good of a person you are. Right. How they feel about themselves. And yeah. How they feel about themselves. Like if I put something out on Twitter or on Instagram and nobody likes it and nobody likes me. <laughs> right. 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 That's a sad, that's a sad thing. You know, right. that, that, that kids today find their worth based on, their Instagram and Twitter follows. Um, so I think that's, and I, I don't know how I would, I would deal with that. You know, if I was living, if I was a student athlete in this day and age, um, you know, that would be, that would be tough for anyone to feel like their whole identity was based on their social media following and for presence. Sure. For sure. And, you know, I tell people all the time when, you know, when I was in college dealing with coach Crest, we had to be places on the at seven thirteen, right. Um, seven, you know, it's never seven thirty, seven forty-five, and those life lessons allowed me to be successful in business, being on time, and being a great communicator. What's yeah. some, what's some things in, in 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 sports you have learned that that you've applied to your professional life that allow you to be successful? Well, one of the things you just said, Jermail, and you know, when Coach Cress, you know, would make you be somewhere at seven thirteen. You know, the old saying: if you're on time, you're late. Right. Uh, and if you're on time, you really should be 15 minutes early wherever you go, right? Right. I think the first thing that you can do every day is being being on time says something about you. I think it what it says, the message that it sends to to that professor uh, or to your boss or whatever it is, or to the people that work with you, is when you show up on time for things, you get to be there. You don't have to be there. Mm. And I think that people that show up for an eight o'clock at eight o'clock or eight oh one or eight oh two are always kind of last, you know, the last one in there or the last person to show up for practice out on the field or out on the court. Last guy to walk out on the court. You're sending the message to everybody there. You have to be there. You don't get to be there. Whereas if you're the first person on the court, the first person to the class classroom, the first person in the office, man, I get to be here every day. I'm excited about being here and I'm ready to go to work. Right. I think you just send a message real quick to everybody around you that you get to be there versus you have to be there. So we talk about that a lot with our guys about, hey, you're a get to guy. Mm. You're not a guy. Like you get to be here every day. You get to go to a world class, mm. uh, a world class academic institution like Clemson. Show up early so you can sit in the front of the class. Mm. Um, you know, be the first one in the weight room. Be the first one in the cages early. Be the first one out on the field. Be the first one to show up and, and send that message to everybody else. Hey, I'm going to be the first one here because I'm the most excited about being here. And I think it's just a choice. When your feet hit the floor in the morning, you either get to do what you're about to do for that day or you have to do what you're mm. going to do that. And there's people that go to work every day that they have to go to that job. And it just sends the message to everybody around them that I'm just going to try to get through this day mm. because I have to be here versus, man, I get to be here and I'm going to dominate this day. I'm, I think 
I think that's simply, it's really that simple. Uh, you know, there, so there's two things that we talk about with our guys and it kind of sets everything else in motion. You're a get to guy over a have to guy and you can't complain about anything. Mm. I'm, that's it. Just, I'm going to have to steal that one. I hope you don't mind. I'm going to have to steal yeah, that one. Yeah, I mean, I think, and I got that from John Gordon. I read that in a book many, many years ago, and it's so true. If you just wake up every day and say, man, I get to do what I'm about to do versus I have to do it, and I'm not going to complain about anything today. Hmm, it, the, people that, the people that don't complain are the ones that everybody wants to be around hmm. and surround themselves with. So. Yes. He made a name for himself as a star for the College of Charleston basketball teams in the mid to late 90s. And now, Jermell President is doing what he can to make sure that the Charleston area kids have a chance to succeed on the court and in life. So I want to, you know, give some of that back to the community as well. Um, after college and after playing professionally, uh, I started the Day Foundation just to, to be that wealth of knowledge to the kids in the community and, and parents as well. College of Charleston Hall of Famer Jamel President said he saw a need for this while he was in school. So he founded the nonprofit Day Foundation. And his philosophy for success is based on what he calls his oatmeal recipe. Let's go and finish together. Basically, teaches the game of basketball, focusing on skills, development, nutrition, and education. Not only SAT, ACT type stuff, but education for parents in how to navigate through the different levels of athletics. Coach, in closing, um, we do something called the oatmeal recipe. And an oatmeal okay. recipe is uh, skill development, education, and nutrition. And I feel like those three ingredients can go, you know, across the board to where they're playing sports, so you're a professional, what have you. Um, and skill development, like you're talking about before, things that you need to work on to develop your craft. Education, being educated on, on the different plays, on the different the personnel, and nutrition. Um, we know that's very important. So I'm going to just uh, give you those three topics and let you tell me how important they are to you and how do you apply it to your everyday life? And we're going to start with, yeah. skill, start with skill development. So skill development for me, I think that, look, I deal with athletes and I think that if I'm going to talk the talk, then I have to walk the walk. So it's very important that I stay in, in great physical condition. Uh, so I put a high priority on my physical conditioning. I, I, I have not missed a week of uh, weight training since I left college. So oh. I, I, I find time in my schedule to exercise at least three days a week. Um, so that's the first thing when it comes to skill development. Um, I want to make sure that as a coach uh, that I take care of myself so that I can be the best version of myself for my athletes. Mm. So I make sure that I get I, I do everything I can to get as much quality sleep as I can. And I try to make sure that I exercise to stay in great shape so that I feel good and I'm energetic for my guys uh, every single day. Um, I think from an education standpoint, I follow many, many people on social media that are involved in my sport who are some of the best and brightest minds out there. And I try to read as much as I can, listen to podcasts um, on, on leadership, um, on baseball, on culture, anybody that I feel like uh, is kind of at the cutting edge of what they're doing, whether it's in the mental game of baseball, the physical game of baseball, leadership, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and I try to read constantly. Um, and then I would say on the nutrition side, you know, again, I think that uh, try to eat healthy. I try to make sure, and, and nobody's perfect, right? Sure. Uh, but uh, make sure that I stay hydrated. I try to drink a gallon of water a day. Um, I try to make sure that anything I put in my body, for the most part, that it's that it's good for me. Uh, take my vitamins. Uh, so uh, I just think that it's a process. You know, I think that at the end of the day, when you talk about skill development, when you talk about education, when you talk about nutrition, you know, those are your process. Mm. It's just daily process. Touch on your process every day. You know, successful people stack days upon days upon days upon days. That's really what they do. The best of the best, they just, they're just stacking days. Mm -hmm. They don't take it off. Mm -hmm. uh, so if it's important to you, you do it daily. And I try my best to do, uh, you know, a little bit in those areas every single day the right way uh, so that, you know, that, that I am, uh, you know, living the, doing the best version of myself that I can, that I can be. For sure. For sure. Well, Coach, we appreciate you so much, big guy. It's good to see you. I haven't seen you in about 
20, 25 years or so, yeah. but you're still looking yeah. good and uh, appreciate your time on the, on the podcast, on, on the Triple Threat podcast. Appreciate you. Well, I appreciate you and appreciate what you're doing uh, in the low country for, for, for the young men and women in the low country to try to enhance their development, uh, you know, as they, as, as they go through their walk in life as, as student athletes and uh, just appreciate what you do. Uh, you know, it's, it's great to talk to a, a, a Cougar, you know, a college <laughs> of Truman Cougar. Sure. We spend time together uh, in cool. different sports, but uh, it's always great to connect and just appreciate you, Jamel. Yes, sir. I appreciate you. Uh, have a good day in practice and go get him, big guy. All right, man. Talk to you soon. Yes, sir. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. So there it goes, guys. Another one in the books. We want to thank Monty for coming on and giving us his wealth of knowledge on how to be a student athlete. Uh, Monty, as again, coming from a, a native of South Carolina, went through the whole process of high school, collegiate, and then ended up being a, a, a head coach uh, on a big time uh, major league platform. So big ups to him. But what he talked about in his uh, in our interview was what's missing that's what kids are missing is that that team spirit yes yeah, individualized sports the individualized effort but we're missing that team camaraderie when individuals um, come on a, a team per se so that was he that what he was saying in this message so if you're listening to this yeah focus on your individual strengths and weaknesses but also focus on the team concept and how to be Um, cohesive in that environment all right Um, thank you for listening thank you for following we'll be right back what Jermel is doing with today foundation and the approach he's taking to help develop young athletes first of all getting them prepared from the academic standpoint which as you know as well as i do bobby that's the most important element to try to get them to eat healthy to be able to train properly to get the proper education and then hopefully for those who are talented enough to have a chance to move on to perhaps even get a free education by going off to college but i love what jermel is doing it's a wonderful program hopefully more people in the community will get behind it and and some of the businesses involved as well to help sponsor this program because these are the kind of things that every community needs looking out for the best interest of the youth the future of this country is in our youth and everything that we can do to help prepare them better for that is absolutely wonderful and and i can't express adequately enough my admiration and respect for what jermel is doing and hopefully he'll get a lot of help from a lot of people you can follow us on facebook and instagram at jamel president and on twitter at president jamel Make sure to subscribe to this podcast as I'll be bringing you a new interview every month.